get this. Okay, we're going to, the, the, the whole business about Basor is really important because that's the core of so much that is so different than what modern Christianity teaches, and that's the part that I'm spending a lot of time on, and it's, uh, it's important stuff. So, there's more to this Barilash thing. Uh, the Messianic banquet, uh, Yeshua compares the Malkuth, the kingdom, to a wedding feast celebrated after the seclusion of the bride and groom at the consummation of the, of the marriage, which is the union of heaven and earth and so on. Uh, originally, all the priests and rulers of Israel were invited to these things, all the, all the important people, but they made excuses and did not come in, in the parable he tells. So the common people, the poor people and the beggars are invited instead. Uh, and in, in Matthew's Gospel, it says that one of them who doesn't dress with the right dress is kicked out. Uh, it's sort of like, you know, the five virgins that didn't have the lamps, you know, this sort of thing. And I don't know whether that's a Christian reaction or whether that is part of, the, of Yeshua's parable. But the interesting thing is, <coughs> Yeshua's parable is that he was, a, 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 people accused him and said, well, why do you preach your message to the, all the people publicly? You know, why aren't you just, you know, doing, doing it to the worthy people, the small number of people, and all this sort of thing. And so he's saying, basically, you were already invited and you didn't come. I was John the Baptist, you know. And uh, so, so now the message goes out to all of Israel. Well, the backstory is supposed to go out to all of Israel anyway. So, but anyway, it's compared to this banquet that's had after this great wedding. It's a wedding feast. And uh, <clears throat> so Yeshua basically reinterpreted this Shabbat Seder and, uh, and which was done with uh, leavened bread. It was only Passover that was done with unleavened bread. And the, in the earliest forms we find of all the meals that described by Yeshua, the word for bread is the word for leavened bread. That's what was used originally. In fact, a lot of the Catholic reforms, they will go ahead and use leavened bread and rather than unleavened bread and things like this. Now the first Messianic churches or synagogues uh, called this in Greek the agape meal, the love feast. The agape meal was celebrated on the death date of an ancestor. If someone died on the 21st of September, then every year on the 21st of September you get together and have a love feast in his memory. Uh, and that was done with leavened bread. And <clears throat> so this is what that compared to a lot of the early Christians, especially Gentile uh, Christians, when they had meals, when they celebrated the Eucharist, they did it with leavened bread, and they did it as a celebration of uh, the death and resurrection of Yeshua, and so on. Um, and that's how it was done in the early churches that were Greek, the Gentile churches, as opposed to the Jewish ones. And Paul felt that they were having too much fun, and so he wrote in his epistles that you, you should, if you're hungry, go eat somewhere else. When you come here, you've got to discern the body and the blood of the Christ and the body and blood of, of the Messiah, etc. So he established it as a sacramental Eucharist, and that was, that was the beginning of the Mass. It was actually modeled on sacred meals and other mystery religions. And it became what we know as a communion of the Mass, and that was using unleavened bread. And that's why we have the little tiny unleavened bread things, hosts that we use now. And Paul was the one who established it that way. So that's Paul's Eucharist, and it's celebrated as a mystery thing rather than as an actual meal like you would have in a Shabbat meal or something like that. Um, so that goes out, and, uh, and Paul's Eucharist comes in. <coughs> Um, another aspect of the Varnash is the sovereignty of the new humanity. It sits at the right hand of the throne of God. That means that you exercise uh, under you exercise the authorities that God exercises as a creator and as a maintainer of the universe and things like this. Uh, it's not playing God. You are God. You are doing with God. You're cooperating with God. For example, if we were uh, if we're cooperating with nature. Uh, we wouldn't be spraying this whole county with uh, a whole lot of nasty chemicals to kill this moth that the, uh, the agriculturalists don't want, and then spraying the whole city and the whole state with it. You would be using biological methods to cooperate with nature. But if you're going to play God, you're going to go spray everybody with this crap, and you don't know what the results are going to be. 
But so the sovereignty that's being exercised <coughs> is the authority and power of Godhead. That's what human beings are to exercise. Uh, Yeshua tells his disciples that they will each be rulers in Malkuth. They will sit like rulers. Um, in Matthew 19, he says, At the renewal of all things, this is a tikkun, when the Barnabas sits on his glorious throne, you who will follow me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel, and every one of the faithful will receive a hundred times as much and inherit the life of the Olam. We talked more about what that Olam is. Um, and Yeshua says, uh, basically, that there is a triumph of God's sovereignty and the new humanity, not only in heaven, but eventually on earth. And that occurs, <clears throat> not that God isn't here on earth, he's everywhere, but we can't see him, we can't perceive God, we can't perceive his rulership. He says, not a sparrow falls without God, but, but all this evil is going on, all these bad things are going on. But what we cannot see and we are out of touch with, we're not in tune with, and we cannot cooperate with this. So this is the situation we've got ourselves into. And how do we get back? We get through a process of, this is the word, sanctification. It's a purifying, it's a tuning up of your instrument. It's a purifying of yourself and of the earth and all the things you've done to the earth. It's cleaning up the oceans, it's cleaning up the forests, it's uh, cleaning up your relationships with each other, and cleaning up your relationship with yourself. And it's a very introspective, and it's within and it's without. So, in Luke's uh, Acts, <clears throat> The, the sort of reward of this sovereignty, this rulership, is uh, represented by the, the Stephanos, the Greek word for crown. That's the name of a crown. Now we're, now we're talking Greek terms, because in, in Jewish terms it's the oil, it's the anointing, but in Greek terms it's the crown that represents the sovereignty. And so in, in early Gentile Christianity, the reward of the saints is a crown. And the name of the first Christian martyr uh, the first of the Hellenists, uh, the split between the Hebrewists and the Hellenists, is named Stephen, and he's stoned. And the stoning of Stephen is reported as the first one of these martyrs, and so on. Uh, <coughs> Paul says that the church is like the collective body of of the of the Baranash, the bride of Christ on earth, uh, of the heavenly groom, and the Christ meaning the or meaning the Baranash, the new humanity. And he, refers to Jesus, is the head of the body, which is the church. And he, Jesus, is the beginning of the firstborn from the dead. And you'll find me referring to Yeshua in our liturgy as the firstborn of the new humanity. And that's what that's all about. That's why I use that terminology. But even Paul uh, preserves a lot of that in his gospel. <coughs> So now let's go back to that Pauline sentiment, that summary of the Exodus Gospel that's preserved in Mark and Luke and Matthew. And let's look at it in terms of what we've learned. This is the King James Version. The time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe in the Gospel. And this is, of course, goes right along with Protestant theology. You've got to believe. If you just believe, you're saved. And, uh, you know, anything you do doesn't save you, and you don't get saved yourself. All you have to do is believe, and God's kingdom is a kingdom, it's a place, and, <coughs> and you have to repent in order to get there. So, let's talk about the first thing, the time. We've mentioned before that the Greek kairos, the word in the Greek New Testament, means a season, or a cycle, or an age, or an eon. And that is referring to the Olamim, which we will talk about later, the time cycles that are like the Yugas, that are prophesied by Daniel for the dominion of the beasts and the dark forces that rule the earth. These times, this age is now coming to an end. Jesus was a new ager. <coughs> Kingdom. Well, as you know, by now, you've heard, heard me say it until you're sick of hearing, I suppose, but the word is Malkuth which does not mean a king domain, a king place. It's, it means a sovereignty, rulership. In fact, in most places, uh, modern translations will go ahead and translate this as the sovereignty instead of the kingdom. 
But it means the sovereign rule and authority and presence and will of God. It means the powers of God, the will of God, the, the presence of God. It ha it's not a governmental term. <coughs> it's not a kingdom in a geographical sense, uh, which means a king domain. And it's, it's God's universal sovereignty and worship and presence everywhere. Whether I go down to the depths of hell or the heights of heaven, you are there, O oh Lord. So, this is an uh, interesting thing. One of the things my Hebrew, first Hebrew professor taught me was that in Hebrew, before, at the time of Yeshua, before, there were no, the Hebrew vowels were not pointed. You could, there was no way of writing them. You just had to know how to separate the Hebrew letters to know what the words were. And then you had to learn how to sing the vowels because that was where the life of the words was in the vowels. And people would learn how to sing and intone passages of scripture when they would read in the synagogue and so on. So here we have a bunch of a bunch of letters that are together, and they can be interpreted in many ways. One is God is now here. And another one is God is nowhere. And this is the whole thing about the malkuth of God, because we can look at what's going on out in the world and we can say, huh, God's nowhere. There's no God out there. This all sucks, you know. Or we can say God is now here. God is everywhere. Well, that's what the coming of God's Malkuth is. It's the appearing, the manifesting on earth in human affairs and in human perception. And those who are pure in heart will see God. And Yeshua says the kingdom of God is spread out upon the earth and men do not see it. Not just men. <laughs> Women and everybody else. Um, so, here's this term you translate it as at hand. God is at hand. The kingdom, this, this, this sovereignty is at hand. It's drawing near. It's not in the distance because God's Malkuth is always present, but it's appearing and manifesting to us. So what is being proclaimed is, yeah, God's here all the time. He's here watching the whole thing. He's, you know, doing the whole thing. You're not cooperating with him. You're not seeing him. Your perception doesn't allow you to see it. And so uh, you're under the domination of a lot of dark forces. Those that are uh, ignorant, spiritually ignorant, are considered to be blind. They don't see. So what is being revealed, God's Malkuth, <coughs> is something that's not just being revealed to our perception, but into, in our hearts and other kinds of things. And that will change. That will be a change. That will change how things are done down here and how things are perceived. So this is being revealed to the world of mankind, world of humanity. In a way it never has been before. Now here's the word repent. Uh, it's the word, Aramaic word nacham, which means to submit, submission. The word Islam is, is, uh, is another version of this root. Islam means submission to God, to submit. And it means to submit the lower to the higher. Submit your body to your soul. Yeshua says, uh, 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 woe to the soul that depends upon the body but because in fact the body depends upon the soul you have to get your poor priorities right so Naham is submitting to the higher nature to the higher guidance in the New Testament <coughs> Greek word used for translating as metanoia and that reflected the whole Gentile thing of Christianity being something that had to do with discursive thoughts and ideas. It's a Gentile Christian conversion ethic. That means change your mind, change your way of looking at things, and, and it lost the true meaning of it about submission to the way of God. It didn't mean, uh, it could mean to look with regret upon bad things you've done and change them, but it didn't mean that. It didn't mean to re repent, to rethink. Uh, and the reason that Gentile Christianity got so hung up on thinking and belief and all this sort of stuff is because the Gentiles didn't know the Jewish religion. I mean, they didn't know, they, they, they knew many different gods and they had a way of different ways of looking at it. So they had to be indoctrinated into a whole different thing, whole new scriptures and everything. So an awful lot of it was about belief for the Gentiles. And then we have the word believe in. Uh, this is the Aramaic term that comes from the triliteral root, A-M-N, 
from which we get Amen. Jesus says, Amen, Amen, I sing unto you in faithfulness, faithfully I say to you. But it means to keep faith with and be faithful to. It doesn't mean to believe anything. It doesn't mean that you have to intellectually have a creed that you subscribe to. And if you change one word of the creed, you're going to hell when you die and all this sort of thing. So this word means fidelity, perseverance, keeping faith with. It's a covenantal word. The Greek word that was translated with the monk in the present, kistis, <coughs> as belief, it completely distorts this meaning and turns the bastor, the proclamation of Yeshua, into a belief system rather than a system of practice, of fidelity, of halakha. And, uh, and, and accepting and, and seeking interior guidance. So they turned it into a creedal whole thing. And by the end of the first century, we're already starting to get basic creeds. Actually, the, 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 the title that Paul uses, Jesus Christ, probably comes from uh, the earliest affirmation that Yeshua is Mashiach. Yeshua is the Messiah. So Yeshua HaMashiach was what the Messianic Christians would say. Yeshua is the Son of Man. We are the Son of Man. And uh, that becomes Jesus is the Christ. And so on. So that's the very beginning of creeds. So let's paraphrase what the Basso, what the Gospel that Yeshua said really is and what it would look like today if we were to understand it. He says, the great cycles of time during which evil forces have dominated humanity and ruled the earth and separated humanity from God are coming to an end, as predicted by Daniel. Not this Daniel, but who knows, maybe it was this Daniel. <laughs> and the sovereign authority that Malkuth, which is God's wisdom, compassion, and justice, and spiritual truth, are now becoming manifest on earth through the spiritual rebirth, through the action of the Baranash, to help all souls reclaim their divine heritage and reunite, reunite heaven with earth. In other words, this is the coming of God's Malkuth, is not uh, a conqueror coming and flying out of the sky with a bunch of horses to kill the Romans. It is the coming of a whole different uh, paradigm, <laughs> to use modern terms, I guess. <clears throat> and uh, so therefore, the proper thing is to submit to heaven's way, submit to God's way, and keep faith with God's prophetic proclamation. So that's what the, a paraphrase, one way you might paraphrase Yeshua's boss or his proclamation. Now, it's all in, in terms of Jewish Haggadah and Jewish legend and Kabbalistic things and Messianic expectation. So we're trying to kind of put it down into terms that we can understand better in this century. But that is, I think, a pretty fair way of, of understanding what his gospel was. What it was not was, you've got to believe that this is the only religion in the world and that Jesus came down from heaven to save your soul. And if you love Jesus and you, and you confess his name, and you believe in Jesus, and that means believing in the something or other Baptist church from some of whatever the splinter group, then you'll be saved, you know, and all this kind of stuff. That, that's not what Jesus was proclaiming. And that's what came to be proclaimed. And that's too bad. Yeah. I'm sure you'll be addressing it, but how does one then discern what is heaven's way? Is that what you're talking about? We're going to talk about that, what the name of God means. Mm -hmm. And that, and I'll show you that it's a Kabbalistic thing. Mm -hmm. And it has to do with justice, mercy. It's like Masonic stuff, you know, you've got mercy and you've got justice and all this kind of stuff. Anyway, we'll get into that later quite, quite a bit. So, now we have to see what the legacy of St. Paul is, what Paul did to change this. And I, I, I want to understand by saying I'm a great admirer of Paul. I think he was a great, great spirit and a great man, but he changed all this stuff. He made it possible for this to become a world religion, I suppose you could say, although the real person responsible for that was Peter. It was Peter that made the original changes. 
But uh, Paul had his own gospel, and he was not an apostle. He was not a student, a direct student of Yeshua. So all scholars agree that he was taught the Nasar by the original Talmudim, the original disciples of Yeshua, and the one who healed him uh, was probably his first teacher. Uh, Paul had been a disciple of Gamaliel, who was a great rabbi in the tradition of Hillel, not of Shammai. He was a, a liberal kind of guy. Uh, but, not a, but not a disciple of Yeshua. He never even heard Yeshua teach. Uh, and he was, with his group, his Pharisaic, his Hasidic group, were decided these Messianic Jews were getting out of hand, and uh, they wanted to arrest them for... Uh, they were they were making everybody uh, vulnerable to Roman uh, uh, purges and things like that because the Romans were afraid that they were talking about an earthly kingdom and things like that. So he was actually sent with with a legal papers. <clears throat> he stood by while Stephen was stoned, according to the Book of the Acts, and held the coats of the people that did it. Was willing and then sent him to it. And then he was sent to Damascus with orders to give to the Jewish authority there to arrest the Messianic Christians there. But on the road to legally charge and imprison, and, and imprison the Jews, he was struck blind. And by his own account, he had a vision of Yeshua, the risen Yeshua, the risen Lord. And this is not during the 40-day period after the crucifixion, which is a, a very important period of time that I've been talking to you about. But he had this vision. And the vision simply said, and that's who he assumed it was, it simply said, uh, uh, Paul, why do you kick against the pricks? Something like someone riding a horse would say to the horse. Who <laughs> You say, you, you're, you're kicking it? Well, let's go. Let's move. And the horse isn't moving. You know, uh, Why do you kick against the pricks? And, uh, and anyway, so Saul is blind. He can't see anything. He's led blind all the way to Damascus. And he's uh, brought to one of the Talmudim of Yeshua, not, not even one of the apostles we know of. He's pretty much anonymous, but his name was Ananias. And he was given a vision to go to this place and meet Saul. And he laid hands on him and cured his blindness. And then he taught him the Basor. He taught him the gospel from the beginning. Uh, Pharisaic partisans from Jerusalem uh, came to arrest Paul when they heard that he had become a messianic. Jew, and he escaped in a basket over the city walls, a very famous escape. And after 17 years of instruction, where he learned the best, or he learned things, he developed it, he went through a lot of things, he started to make missionary journeys and uh, to Gentile churches. Now, you have to understand that here's how it was. In the ancient world, there were synagogues of Jews all over the ancient world. They were in a diaspora. Ever since the Jews had been taken captive and taken to Babylon, the Jews were in, living in lots of places and they lived in Alexandria, a big Jewish quarter and so on. And they spoke, a lot of them spoke Greek. They didn't even speak Hebrew or Aramaic because there were so many generations into those things. And uh, at their synagogues, there were many people who were not Jews, but who were, uh, who were felt loyal to the, Jew, to the God of the Jews because the God of the Jews was, this idea of monotheism and the way it was being taught at that time was very attractive to many people. These people were called the God-fearers. They were Gentiles. And they were allowed to sit on the outside part of the synagogue to hear scripture being read and to discuss things with other people. And if they wanted to become Jews, uh, some of them could be made into Jews by being, the men could be uh, circumcised. And it was, a, it was quite a big thing to become a Jew in the old world. So most of them didn't. Most of them didn't, really didn't want to do that. And uh, so they, but they were, there was quite a crowd of Gentiles that were around these, these things. Well, when the apostles came to, they went from synagogue to synagogue in the ancient world, first all through Israel, then through other nations. And they would preach their message and they would be, in fact, we have a whole word that was invented in Greek called aposynagogene to kick someone out of the synagogue. Uh, and they were apple synagoguing. <laughs> they were kicked out, but a lot of the, several of the Jewish members of the church followed them, wanted to hear more of it, and a lot of the Gentile God-fearers did. And so actually what happened is there started to be communities of, uh, 
a synagogue, so to speak, or ecclesia, gatherings of, uh, of Gentile believers who, or Gentile people who wanted to become Messianic Jews or were very interested in it and wanted to be baptized, etc. Well, these are the people to whom Paul started making journeys in all these places like Greece and Asia Minor and things like that. And he started some of the Gentile churches in Greece and places like that. Um, now he had to talk to these people. Well, of course, he was a, he was a brilliant man who was not only uh, Aramaic speaking, but basically he was Greek speaking. It was like today Eng being English speaking if you're from another country. And that's the kind that, you know, like these lamas that come here that can speak English are the ones who can raise millions of dollars and build beautiful retreat centers like this. Well, he was like that, and he spoke Greek beautifully. He had to be all things to all men, as he said, in the Roman Hellenistic world, and his self-proclaimed mission was to transform Christianity from the Jewish Messianic sect into a world religion for the, and his word is salvation, of all mankind. And he developed his own unique interpretation of Yeshua as the world savior. Uh, now remember, he had this experience with what he felt was Jesus. He was, that was Jesus that he saw. Uh, who knows? I mean, you know, when you have visions, it's it's you're going to see what you want to see. You know, if you're if you're a Sioux Indian, you'll see the six grandfathers or whatever. You know, but, but he saw Jesus, and so to G, to him, Jesus became the Christ. It was Jesus who was the Christ, and that, and that was a little different. Paul says the gospel which was preached by me is not after man, for I neither received it of man, not, neither was I taught it by a revelation, but by a revelation of Jesus. And he called it my gospel. Don't believe the gospel of that guy or the gospel of that guy who's, a, who's an apostle of Yeshua. Believe my gospel. Um, and it became the basis for Gentile Christian, what we call proto-Orthodox and Gnostic church theology and for much of what is found in the New Testament Gospels. Uh, and Protestant, Catholic, Orthodox, and Gnostic theology are all based on the Gospel of Paul, not of Yeshua. The Gnostics all went traced back to Paul. The first original New Testament was put together by the, the Gnostic bishop Marcion, and it was made of nothing but the Gospel of Luke and Acts, and then all the writings of Paul. The writings of Paul are very mystical, and, and you can find the Gnostic eons in them, and all kinds of interesting things. So this New Testament was first compiled by the Gnostic based on Paul's epistles. So the idea of receiving revelations from, you know, a deity that appears to you in visions and in ecstasies and gives you directions and guidance is what now became the basis for authority in the Pauline traditions and the Gnostic traditions, not historically what Yeshua taught. So taught, Paul taught his own unique gospel about Jesus, not the basso of Yeshua, even though he knew it. So we can dig it out of Paul if we understand, if we can unspin Paul and understand where he's coming from. For Paul, Jesus was the eternal cosmic deity, the Christ, who brought salvation. That was Paul's term. You won't find it in many of the teachings of Jesus. Salvation means to take something that's been discarded or something that's in filthy condition and pull it out and redeem it that way. From sin and the world. So salvage, redemption, and deliverance from the world and the flesh is an actually an ascetic idea. In fact, Paul talks about he, he's an ascetes, he's an athlete. A uh, spiritual athlete, athletic was being a person who was self-renouncing all the time and even restricting your diet and then doing all kinds of things and doing all kinds of practices. And it's an ascetic ideal, which was not what Yeshua was. Yeshua was criticized for being a wine bibber and a glutton. He didn't have special diets and he uh, didn't make his disciples wear hair shirts, things like that, like John the Baptist. So Paul adopted a whole different view of this. And it was the view, the thing that was a holy man in the ancient Hellenistic world, was one who was, who was an ascetic. Uh, maybe you sat on top of a pole for uh, 15 years and meditated or something like that. That's a holy man. You know, what's this Jesus going around drinking wine and then, you know, Paul's title, of Jesus Christ, as I said, is from probably the original Christian creed, Yeshua HaMashiach, which becomes Jesus Christos, and becomes a name, a title. And the problem is that Paul's Christ was a world saver and redeemer with many parallels to the Hellenistic gods and religions. You will find that out of this 
Out of myth or religion and, and Adonis and other characters, we start to get things like the virgin birth and a whole lot of other kinds of interesting things that come out of other religions and come out of Hellenistic context and get into Christianity very quickly. Now, I love mystery religions and mystery cults. I think they're wonderful, but I would just like to keep my my Yeshua straight here, if you don't mind. So, isn't that, you, Lewis, in yeah. the early church then, there wasn't the discussion of the virgin birth and the magi and all this sort of stuff. This was added it's in, it's in the Gentile churches, and it comes after Paul. It like comes hundred years after Jesus? Well, years. no. Well, Mark, Mark's Gospel is written around 50, 60 AD, and we still don't have a virgin birth yet there. But now by the time we get Luke and Matthew in, the, in 70, 80, maybe 80 AD, we're starting to have the virgin birth and we're starting to have the magi and the whole thing mm -hmm. and all the stuff, you know. But Yeshua, the very word means liberation. It doesn't mean salvation. Liberation from the bondage and burden, burdens of evil on earth, not escape from the earth. And the liberation of by Yeshua frees souls from the bondage of evil and transforms the world through sanctification. You're not trying to leave the world because it's a filthy place and, and you're going to, uh, you know, uh, the flesh and the devil are going to leave behind. You're going to change the world. You're going to, it's incarnational. It's a positive future for our world. It's not, well, we're in the fellow of the Ukraine now and we're all going to turn into cannibals or something like that. Paul's salvation salvages souls from the evil world. It's a setting and a negative world in the future. And it becomes the basis for how Gentile Christians look to Christianity. Jesus became a god. And uh, the world was an evil place, which it was. <laughs> and uh, the goal was to get out of it eventually, not to change it. Now, Paul claimed the authority of the apostles, the actual top close students of Yeshua based only on his vision of Christ. He said, well, I saw him risen afterwards, so I, I'm a student too. I'm an apostle. I was, a, I was born late. Uh, and the consequences for Christianity about this are that this claim of authority based on having visions of Jesus became the, the whole basis for Gnosticism. Gnostic splinter groups are all visions of Jesus comes down and teaches you this. You can read second, third century Gnostic Gospels and things where Jesus appears to someone and teaches them a whole lot of stuff and you develop a whole language and it's not even Jewish Gnosticism anymore, it's, it's, it's uh, Greek Gnosticism and so on. And these groups uh, came to, into existence uh, based on these the, the visions and revelations of their founders. had nothing to do with what was taught by Yeshua. It had to do with their own visions. And then later on, in medieval Christianity, when the Protestants needed authority because none of them were bishops, they couldn't make any more, they couldn't, they couldn't have ministry. And uh, the whole basis of authority in the ancient church for a thousand years was apostolic authority. It was um, the, whatever the bishops, when they got together, decided that was the Holy Spirit leading them. Uh, and now they need something else and they can say, well, look, it doesn't work because look how corrupt all of the church is and they were right didn't work very well. <laughs> uh, so they, they, they came back to scripture. The Bible will be our authority. Back to the Bible. So for about 400 years, the Bible has been the authority for Protestantism. And the other thing they did is ministry. Uh, they couldn't make priests. They couldn't have apostolic ministers. So uh, they were elected or they were appointed or they were they self-appointed by spontaneous uh, vocation, like a shaman. It would suddenly be, you know, Vision. So that's, these are all consequences for Christianity of this stuff. Well, that's why they're ministers instead of priests. Yes, and that's why they are not priests, they are ministers. Yeah. Now, the Anglican Church has valid orders in spite of the fact that Catholic Church has opposed the idea that they did for a long time. The Orthodox Churches do, etc. We all have apostolic orders that have come down historically in lineage. Uh, but um, Methodist churches don't, and Presbyterians don't, and Baptists don't, and so on. Now, also.
also, scholars of all denominations agree, that what is called the Evangelion, the Evangel, the Gospel, and the New Testament Gospels, we call them Gospels, is a development of Paul's Gospel about Jesus. It's not the vast work proclaimed by Yeshua and his apostles. And that, you, you, anyone who is a scholar will not disagree with you on that unless he's an idiot or he's got a big axe to grind. A lot of them do because their salaries are paid by denominations. Um, <clears throat> but there are also, everybody agrees, effective ways to recover the historical proclamation and the Holocaust and the practices and the Haggadah and the Kabbalah and the teachings of Yeshua. And that's what was begun in the Yeshua seminar in 1980, about eight years after I started the process and I wrote The Authentic Jesus. And then a lot of the conclusions I came to in that, those people made, and these are scholars of a lot of different denominations. The Yeshua seminar, by the way, is, is, is despised by the biblical fundamentalists because they think that it comes up with too much stuff that uh, goes against their creeds, and, they, and it does. Uh, so since Paul's writings are one generation earlier than the earliest Christian gospel, which is Mark, and therefore the earliest record of the Master's teaching, even though it's skewed with Paul's own unique gospel, they can be unspun using redaction criticism and other kinds of techniques we have. For example, the authentic Pauline epistles, like these, can be mined for historical teachings of Yeshua, even though they're spun by Paul the way Paul wants to spin it, but for his own gospel, because he was a disciple of first generation Talmud of Yeshua. He knew it. He knew what the whole story was. And, and you can find some, there's, a, there's some great scholars that have gone back and, and this may seem amazing to you, but Christianity didn't know diddly about Judaism until this century. It never even bothered to look. Certainly. Understand. Oh yeah. The first Christian scholars who started to look among and, and, and read the intertestamental literature and, and, and see what Jews had to say about Jesus and what was going on in Jewish literature and all that, that all, that all started about 50 years ago. Mm. There was a great uh, biblical scholar who was also a law professor at UC Berkeley who wrote a book called Paul and Rabbinic Judaism in which he opened the door to, oh yeah, I guess Paul was a rabbi, wasn't he? You know, And he did have all this training. And, all the stuff he's talking about comes out of this Haggadah and all this, oh, how interesting. And, and that kind of stuff has been opened up and opened up more and more. And that's, uh, uh, and, and, a lot, and of course there was absolutely, uh, by the same token, in Judaism there was no Jewish scholars studying Christianity or even interested in it until someone like Raphael Patai came along and other people who started looking and saying, well, hey, yeah, this guy, Yeshua, he was one of us, actually, he was one of our rabbi. Why, why did they get to claim him, you know, what's all this about? So this, this research had, has begun, but it's very new, and it therefore doesn't influence the institutions of Judaism or Christianity at all. Sorry, who did the Yeshua seminar that you talked about? Who, the Jesus that? seminar? Or, yeah, yeah, whatever. Uh, it started in about the 1980s. There were, there were Catholics and Protestants and different people in a certain university, and then they exchanged papers for a long time, and they were trying to get at the historical teachings of Jesus the way that I, was, I had been doing as well. Mm -hmm. And it's had a lot of impact, but it's, it's not going anymore, but there's big web pages with a lot of stuff on it, and some mm -hmm. that I refer to. But I say that we can mine Paul for authentic information, but not because you can't take it literally. Because Paul has his own spin, his own axe to grind, which he calls my gospel. And this brought him into conflict with the original apostles and the historical disciples of Jesus, of Yeshua. And it also made him the hero and the advocate of the emerging Gentile Messianic Christians. And so, therefore, he was the hero to the people who won the war. <laughs> You know, the, 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 war, the history of the war is always written by the victors, right? Mm -hmm. And that's who it was. And so Paul became the great, you know, and Paul's way became what it was all about. But you say, well, shouldn't Christianity be based on the teachings of Yeshua, not of Paul? And yes, it should, but it's not. <laughs> that's what this is all about. So we want to get a clear understanding of the difference between the proclamation or basura of Yeshua and the gospel of Christianity. And that's why I emphasize this first part of the
Uh, the message proclaimed by Yeshua is very different than in Christianity. It's a proclamation of the advent of a new humanity and as, as a divine inheritor of God's authority. That sounds pretty far out. That's very, very far-reaching stuff. Uh, and it's corporate. It's not one guy. It's not Jesus is the Christ. It's we are all the Christ, but we're Christ's in the making. We're little Buddha seeds, you know. Uh, an heir or an inheritor means one who's coming of age to participate in the works of the Almighty, not to replace God. We're not taking over. We're not God is dead and we're taking over or something like that. But we're becoming, we're little godlets becoming that way. And Christianity dis dissolves then into the gospel doctrines about Jesus the heavenly redeemer, uh, modeled on the Greek savior gods and the Gnostic redeemer myth and other concepts that are basic to the Basar of Yeshua, like the Malkuth, the sovereign presence of God long hidden from people. And, uh, who are in bondage to evil forces and dark forces that will begin to reveal its power on earth. That becomes, uh, uh, and, and is based on the idea of the Messiah, the Vayanash, a new humanity that's going to make God's way real and visible and manifest on earth. Uh, some of the great Catholic saints have said things like, we are the fingers and hands of God. And that's what Yeshua was saying. It, God doesn't come here and put it in our hands, you know, we are the ones that have to do it. It's a do-it-yourself project. And uh, the Malkuth of God does not come by observation. As you said, it's not low here, no there, below there. It's like the slow growth of a mustard seed. He said the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed, just the smallest of all possible seeds, but it has so much vital force that it becomes the largest of all bushes and trees, which it was in Palestine. And he says the Malkuth is within you. And the word in Greek is entos, inside of you. And when we start talking about lev, about the heart, and understanding about the good and evil nature and all these sort of things, we'll understand more what's being referred to here. And the Malkuth is not a place. It's a state of divine reality that includes all places and times and all ages. So... This was what was proclaimed by Yeshua. But this devolves in the Christianity, in the Christian church, from Malkuth into the New Testament Basilion, which means kingdom. It means a place where a king rules, the Basilion of God. And it's a specific place, meaning, and, and, and Catholic doctrine becomes a church militant on earth and church after death and all kinds of things like this, but it's a place. And it's sort of like the magic kingdom in Disneyland. Here's the kingdom of God. Ah, you know, there it is. Uh, I don't think Goofy and Mickey Mouse come out to greet you, but you know, <laughs> Peter does at the gate. Uh, so traditionally, it's up in the sky and represented on earth by the Christian church. And then the Bar Enosh, the Mashat, the Messiah, and in Yeshua's terms, it's the advent of a coming humanity that God is anointed to share sovereign stewardship and rulership of all worlds. And each incarnate soul must be spiritually born as a member of this humanity. It's a process of individual sanctification, life transformation, one soul at a time. And the corporate new humanity must grow mature into co-sovereignty with God as a process of human spiritual evolution. But this evolves in Christianity to the idea of the Christian Christos, the Christ, Messiahship or Christhood belongs to Jesus only. He's a God. I worship him. Believe in him. He comes and rescues you. you know, he, he's from the heavenly redeemer, comes down to save believers from hell and even to heaven if they qualify. So here's Jesus and here's all the You know, like this. Okay? That's the Jesus of the church. And the Jesus is the Christ, is that the thing we're all little dirt clots and sort of cling to his things. So I believe Joshua believe he is not God. He's simply the first teacher and leader of this new humanity. He is the proclaimer of it. He's the first one. He's the he's the master of it, so to speak. He's the one who brings it through. But Yeshua was asked, and, and a, a wealthy man comes up to him in Mark's Gospel, one of the earliest ones, and he says, "Good master, what shall I do to inherit the life of the eon?" And he says, "Why do you call me good? There's only one good, and that's God." 
And Jesus doesn't go around teaching himself as being God, although he says you are all gods. In John's Gospel, he's presented as God by the writers of the Gospel, but that's a hundred years later, and that's because of their theology, and they put those words into his mouth because he is the, the Bar Enosh. He's the Son of Man. He represents all that. And there's some reasons for that. There's good stuff you can get out of the Gospel. Now, so primary concepts for Yeshua, there's the Basra, the proclamation of an heir to the king's sovereignty. There's the anointing of the Son of Man, or of the new humanity as the heir of God. There's the Messianic birth pangs and the royal marriage and, and, and union. The Malkuth is the sovereign power, the will, the presence of God. The uh, very important aspect is, um, is your emuna, your covenant with God, which is not your belief, it's your faithfulness to the way of God. We're going to talk about what the way of God is. And nacham is to submit your lower self to the higher that, that will guide you. It says, submit to the sovereign authority or interior guidance of heaven. Now, in Christianity, Basar became the Greek Evangelion. Church doctrines about Christ, the Evangelion, the Evangel, the Gospel, the Good News, the Gospel, which is all creedal material. The Basileian became the king place, the king domain. It's a place in heaven, it's a place on earth, it's the church. Uh, the word pistis, which comes in, becomes in Latin cred, as in, as in the word creed or credulous, uh, is about belief. It's not about fidelity. Not about keeping faithful to you. And Naham is not about submitting your lower to the higher, but it's about the word metanoia is changing your mind, it becomes in Latin re poena, which becomes changing your mind becomes sort of apologize and do penance or repent and repense in French and so on. So that while that certainly is a part of this. A very important part, you have to be able to admit you're wrong and, you, and to try to fix the things you made wrong and redress the things in yourself. And regret is a positive feeling to have about certain things. That's not the essence of all things. It is Naham, which is submission and fidelity. So, when does the Malkuth come? Where does it come? How does it come? Yeshua, in lots of places, is quoted as, from the time of John the Baptist until now, violent people have been trying to take over the Malkuth of heaven by force. Very, one, what a lot of scholars used to call a dark sin. What does he mean by that? What's been going on? Well, if you know history, you know that there were many self-proclaimed messiahs at the time of Yeshua who were zealot leaders who tried to lead insurrections against the Roman. So there had been a lot of violent people trying to do that. So what he's, what he's saying is that Malkuth began to appear on earth when John the Baptist proclaimed the kingdom of the 
engineered, people started to be able to see it, understand it. And zealots and other girl fighters have really successfully tried to establish it by force. Another thing Yeshua said is all the books of the prophets and the law of Moses foretold what would happen up to the time of John. If you believe their witness, then you must believe that John is Elijah, the prophet you've been waiting for. Because it was, it was predicted that uh, before the great and terrible day of the Lord, Elijah would come and turn the hearts of the fathers to the sons and the sons to the fathers. And it was always expected that Elijah would come. Even today, on Passover, everybody puts out a cup for Elijah. And are you going to come today, Elijah? No, I don't think so. So, uh, you know, it hasn't happened yet uh, in Judaism. But <clears throat> uh, in his view, uh, that all the, pro the, the biblical prophecy we have talks about things up to the time of John. He, another place, says that John is the greatest. Is, did you go out to see a, a reed shaken by the wind? No, you went out to see a great prophet, but more than a prophet. I tell you, he is Elijah, who is to come. And then he says, and yet, uh, John the Baptist is the greatest of all the old humanity. But uh, even the littlest one, the least one in the Malkuth is greater than John. So th this is a kind of distinction that gets made. Uh, Messianic prophecies say Elijah will come and restore the true Hebrew religion and prepare the way for God's kingdom to manifest on earth. Uh, the idea that John the Baptist is Elijah and Malkuth is appearing, and uh, in my novel, uh, you see he has mystic experiences with Elijah and John the Baptist from the time he's born, etc. Uh, that uh, uh, there, this idea is not necessarily a confirmation of the idea of reincarnation, although there were several uh, sects, uh, that all of the, the Pharisee and Hasidic sects, that accepted resurrection or Hima, the idea that the, the just, the really righteous, would continue in consciousness at higher levels after death. Uh, many of them also were believers in reincarnation, and that was a part of the, the scene. Uh, Yeshua never made many direct proclamations about reincarnation as an explanation for why somebody was born blind or something, but he did very clear, very greatly proclaim that Elijah was reincarnated as John the Baptist. Um, and that's the sign of the coming of the kingdom. And he says, if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the mouth of God has come upon you. Because that was, you know, that was the prophecy. That at the time of the day of the Lord, the evil ones would be overthrown. They would be exercised. Uh, and verily I say to you, there be some standing here which will not taste of death till they see the fire and nash coming in his mouth uh, So that's why, uh, you know, the translation of till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom is the way it would be translated in the that's why Albert Schweitzer would say uh, he expected the kingdom to manifest and impinge on the earth and all that any day now, you know. And the Christians are all waiting any day now for it. Uh, and he was wrong. No, that's not what he's saying. He's saying something far more profound than anything like that. Verily I say to you, you disciples, you tell me that you shall not have gone over all the cities of Israel till the choir and I should be come. Till the new humanity be coming in and be on the Okay, so this is something that's happening right now. It's not something that's happening in 2,000 years or 20 years or have to go to the mountaintop because the world is going to end and all this. So he's talking about a mystical event. He's talking about something that's happening on the earth now. Where, Yeshua says, and we get this with parallels and synoptics, when will the mountain come? Yeshua said, it will not come by watching for it, it will not be settled. There, rather, the Father's mouth is spread out upon the earth, and people do not see it. And this is a very important uh, uh, statement. Most scholars think this is an authentic login, even though this play which only appears in Thomas, uh, the rest of it appears in others. Luke and other parallels say, Behold, the mouth of God is within you, and the word is inside of you. Within it means within your heart. And how will it come? Yeshua says, when he was demanded of the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God should come, he said, so the kingdom of God should come, not with observation. You can't look for it. And he said, it's like a woman who's carrying a jar full of meal. While she was walking along a distant road, the handle of the jar broke, and the meal spilled behind her, and she didn't know it. She hadn't noticed a problem. When she reached her house, she put the jar down and discovered it was empty. 
And that is a parable that says basically you won't be able to see how the kingdom comes. You won't be able to see when it comes. Uh, you won't see, the, see where it starts to appear because it's, it happens in a mystery. It happens in mysterious ways. So that is the teaching that we really have from Yeshua about the Malkuth. So all other parables, the one I like the best to explain is, is the parable of the mustard seed, which basically said he's asked what is the kingdom of God. He said it's like a seed of mustard, which is the smallest of all seeds, but uh, when it grows, it perseveres and, and perseveres. He said you must have the a main of a, you must have the enluna, the faithfulness of a, of a grain of mustard seed. Maybe just little tiny little things like this. Starts out as the tiniest of all things and becomes the largest of all bushes. And that's what you have to have. And he compares that to faith, or that is to fidelity, to perseverance. We we'll talk about this in, in Holop and more about this. So I say that this is what should be, this kind of thing should be taught. In the churches. This is the gospel that the churches should be teaching, not the worship of a, a redeemer from heaven and all this sort of thing. And uh, but I don't know whether this is going to be meaningful to people in the 21st century. If this is true, if what Yeshua said is true, and that we are a new humanity, we must be new by now. You know, there's been a lot of suffering, a lot of trial, a lot of martyrs, a lot of whatever else. Do we even need to be baptized? Are we a new humanity? Are we all members of the new humanity? If so, then maybe the fundamentalists are wrong when they say, oh, no, no, you cannot do operations on women's sexual organs. It's 18, the year is 1850. They want to remove a cancer from a woman's sexual organs. Can't do that because that's, you know, that's trying to play God, you know, and all that kind of stuff. No, uh, this whole issue of, uh, we, we're, we're, in the last hundred years, we. We've gained power over all kinds of things. And the problem is, how are we going to use this power? Atom bombs and stuff like that. And that's what Barbara Marks Hubbard is all about. We're, we're going to have this power. This is, these, are, these are divine powers. How are we going to use them? Are we going to use them to poison the planet and poison our children's cereals and everything else? And just to make a little few extra bucks? Or are we going to, what are we going to do? We actually have the power to do something dinosaurs couldn't do. We, uh, if, a, if a rogue asteroid comes at us and is going to cause a mass extinction again, we can probably stop it. We can, we can move it. We can make it miss us. We can see it coming. We can do things that couldn't be done before. And they're, they're of course, just tiny little powers compared to the powers of the universe. But we have these things now. So what Barbara Marks Hubbard has brought up and what her whole issue is about is how do we use these powers? How, how should we be doing this? We, instead of saying, oh no, let God protect us and God does all this, we have to start taking control and being taking responsibility for who we are, what we are, and how we do things in a whole different way. Because we are co-creators with God, co-sovereigns with God. We have to learn what that means. Yeah. yeah the very question you're asking, I think, is the basis when you start talking about atom bombs and the man who discovered the Turing from the second, my second wife's grandfather. And he wasn't trying to make, he was, they, they made more than the Nobel Prize and they made a museum down in La Jolla after him. But he wasn't trying to do that, he was trying to give hydrogen fuel and water to the world. That was a real intention. Oh, that's what he was at. That's what he was doing, and the American government switched it into the hydrogen bomb and blew away the Japanese. And that's from personal family, personal family history. I think the real, the real intent, even in your, in your question, is the basis of how you, how you affect your belief systems that affects all the, the way technology is used. The way we affect this world, the way we affect all the, the knowledge of Otto Warburg with oxygen and cancer. We don't have to do the surgery. They know how to deal with it. There's the book right there from the, from the, from the Nobel Prize winner, Otto Warburg. Uh, it's, it's how we utilize that baseline understanding of what you're teaching. When, when you do it in love and you do it out of kindness and, and humanity, and you do it out of loving your brothers and sisters, really, then all of those technologies change. Well, it's, 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 ter it's, it's terrifying to read the transcripts of the prayer meetings that President Reagan had with all of his cronies and that were exposed by a lady who lived out here in Monterey. 
because they truly believed that the world was going to come to an end pretty soon, the rapture was coming, we didn't have to worry about right. conservation, we didn't have to worry about cleaning up the oceans, we didn't have to it's worry horrible. about anything, you know. And there's this kind of stuff that goes on is, is an absolute abrogation it's of right. our responsibility. Destruction of the destruction of the creation. Yeah. But there's an important, I'm sorry. Well, there's an important difference. If we follow what you're suggesting, Absolutely. then we're responsible to grow up and mature Absolutely. and take our own authority and become self-validating. If you take the other one, then you stay in a corporate situation in which you're managed by others and you're not responsible for anything because all you have to do is say, okay, you're in charge. So therefore you can be totally frozen and you basically give your power over to the very forces that are, are, are the ones in control of power and energy. But the thing is, you know, I mean, for example, a good classic Republican political philosophy is that we need to be all be self-sufficient and self-reliant. But along with that is this absolutely ridiculous idea that uh, we don't need to take care of society, we don't need to deal with the people that can't do that, that the people who can't do it just don't deserve to be here anyway, and all that sort of thing. And so therefore we, will, we, we hate socialized medicine, and we hate socialized education, which we have, public education, everything else. So, you know, people haven't got a clear view of what that responsible means. It means a responsibility, not just to yourself, but to all other people and to humanity. That's because the devil made me do it. Yeah, yeah. what were you going to say? Um, when he, when Jesus talks about the Malkuth being like the woman with the jar of the meal, one of the things that I got from that is that we really need to pay attention. Oh, yeah. You know, if she was being attentive and actually present, she would have noticed the meal slipping out long before. Yeah. So we need to be attentive. And if we were attentive and actually really paying attention, then a lot of the things that the powers that be have gotten away with, they wouldn't have. True. <laughs> Let's so move that's, on. That's part of what we need to do as part of new humanity, is we need to be responsible and we need to be attentive.